the um, ninth week uh, of our Believe uh, series. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about the wonderful, wonderful topic of stewardship. And actually, it is a very important and great, great topic. And so join with me as we pray. Father, from the time of creation, you have commanded us to be stewards of that which you created. And we can track that all the way through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. But yet, it's one of those things that is so difficult at times for us to do. So, as I prayed earlier at our small group time, speak softly and gently to us or club us over the head, whichever we need, so that you can get through to us your truths about stewardship and your call upon our lives. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The title for today is It Isn't Mine. The uh, key question is, what is God's call on my life? And the key idea is, I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. Well, I want to start with um, something that I call the wrong button conundrum. Now, maybe I am just uncoordinated. Uh, maybe I am just not awake sometimes in the morning. Uh, and fortunately, most days I wear a polo shirt rather than something that buttons up. But the wrong button conundrum happens for me generally in the bedroom because that's where I will get dressed. And you get up and you button up your shirt. And um, hopefully you've gotten it right. But the conundrum happens uh, is what do you do when you've made it to work or to school or to wherever you're going, and all of a sudden you, run, you realize that the buttons don't line up quite right. You either started in the wrong one or you skipped one. Hopefully you have caught it, and hopefully I've caught it before I've left the house. But I hate to say it, there have been a time or two through the years where I have been mildly embarrassed when I got someplace where I was going and found that I did not button things up quite correctly. Now, this just isn't a guy thing because women's blouses have buttons. Um, so guy shirts have buttons, women's blouses have buttons, women's skirts and dresses sometimes have buttons. So this is not just a guy thing, is it? I mean, I mean, guys, how many of you have, have done your buttons wrong? Ra raise your hand if you're with me. Okay, okay, we, we all admit that pretty much. Ladies, does that ever happen to you all as well? Okay, so, I, okay, so, so we're, we're all, you all understand the button conundrum. You're probably wondering, what in the world does this have to do uh, with, uh, with stewardship? This is what it has to do with. This was a quote from an unknown author. As creator... God has rights of ownership over all things. And to miss starting here is like misaligning the top button on your shirt or blouse. Nothing else will ever line up. That's where it comes in. The way I find out that it's wrong, typically, and it's a little bit harder today because it's kind of stylish for guys to have their shirts untucked. But the way you find out is when you go to tuck in your shirt, and then it's like, wait a second, one side is like two inches off, and then you fix it. But the problem with us is when we don't start with God owning things, we don't realize that things aren't meshing together. And we, we maybe are experiencing things and we don't realize that it's because we have started in the wrong place. And so today we're going to look at stewardship, which is going to begin with um, Psalm 24, there it is, verses 1 through two, one and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it, he founded it, um, on the seas and established it on the waters. 
In other words, God created it all. Um, when a baby is born in this world, it comes into the world with nothing. It doesn't even have clothes. When a person leaves this world, they leave with nothing. You can't take it with you. So we really don't own it. God does. And so we're going to start when we look at stewardship with the principle of ownership. Um, I think this is the first button. And when we get this first button right, it makes it possible for everything else to line up. And this is it. The fundamental principle of biblical stewardship is that God owns everything. We are simply managers or administrators acting on his behalf. There are a lot of very important words in there. Um, first off, biblical. It is absolutely biblical that God owns it all, period. Whether a person knows God or not, whether a person follows Jesus or not, doesn't make any difference. God owns it all. Okay. Principle number one. And, and as a part of that, that we are stewards or managers acting on whose behalf? On his behalf. Because he is the owner. See, that's, that's a part of this whole ownership kind of thing. And so it's recognizing who owns it, and then means we have to take care of it and manage it as he wants, not as I want. And that is the game changer. That is the game changer. Just recognizing that God owns it isn't the, the game changer. That's the starting point. But until we realize that, no, no, he's got directions on how we're supposed to manage it, that is the game changer. That is the total game changer there. There's a very interesting quote uh, by uh, an author, his name, and he, he leads retreats and um, stuff like that. His name is Bill Peel. Um, and, um, oh, and it comes on to the next part, which is the principle of responsibility. Because we talk about God owning it, and we're supposed to manage on his behalf, and that is where the responsibility comes in. And so this is what Bill wrote uh, on that. It says, although God gives us all things to enjoy, nothing is ours. Nothing really belongs to us. God owns everything. We're responsible for how we treat it. While we complain about our rights here on earth, the Bible constantly asks, what about your responsibilities? Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. Owners have rights, stewards have responsibilities. So let's think a little bit in, in, in a little bit more concrete terms. I want you to think of something that you have in your house or that you own. I mean, actually, we just learned that God owns it, that you highly value. I want you to think of your most highly treasured possession. Okay, I want you to think about it right now doesn't have to be the most valuable. It is something that you treasure and value more than anything else. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to picture doing. Lending it to the person on your right. You did not give it to them. You said, hi, I'm so-and-so. This is mine. I am giving it to you for you to manage, but it is still mine. You are to take care of it. Now, if that's someone who loves you who's given it to you, you're going to probably take care of it an awful lot. Hopefully, if it's somebody that you know, you're going to take care of it really well. Hopefully, you're going to do that anyway, because why? It's not yours. It's theirs. And they've asked you to care for it. Now, I'll be real honest with you. I highly value and treasure my guitar. As far as guitars go, it's not expensive. You would think it's expensive. As far as guitar goes, it's not expensive. You don't know how hard it is for me to let somebody play my guitar. Because this is like my baby. Now, granted, Alyssa and Forrest are my kids, but this is like my baby. 
I have seen how people treat guitars. I've seen how people who are just learning how to play guitars and have a guitar pick in hand, I've seen how they strum guitars. This is my baby. I have a hard time sharing this because I wonder if people are going to take as good a care of it as I do because it's not theirs. Now, I let people use my guitar. But I'll be careful about who I let use it because it's not theirs. Actually, it's not even mine. It's God's. But I would want them to treat it with love and respect because to me it's a prized possession. You see the, the picture that's there? And that picture goes along with what is your prized possession that you have handed to somebody else and you expect them to care for it and to manage it in a way that would give you honor and would honor it because it's not theirs, it is yours. The responsibility that we have of the things that God has brought into our lives is that you and I are called to manage it. It is our responsibility because he is the owner. It is our responsibility. So that takes us to this crazy word that is called um, stewardship. The ancient world did not use the word stewardship or steward in a religious sense at all, at all. It was a business sense, business in of this. It is a compound word in New Testament Greek, and the first part of the word, uh, actually the word, let me get up there, is oikonomia. The first part of the word is from oikos, and that is the word that is generally translated into English as house or household, but what it really means is it is everything that goes on within a particular household. Okay, so we're talking about household. So, let's think of yesterday. How many of you watched the football game yesterday? Okay, what went on in your household besides the football game and, and was a part of your household yesterday besides the football game. So I saw Glenn's hand up. He said, what was something in your house that went on yesterday besides football? Everything I was trying to stop. Everything he was trying to stop. That's, that was, that's a good one. Somebody, what, what else went on in your household yesterday? Laundry. Yes. Leaks in the roof and how to fix it. Didn't you do all that? What else went on in people's houses yesterday? Any of you? Pot of chili. We had meals. What else went on in people's houses yesterday? Tantrums. Tantrums. She's got two young kids. Thank you, Jesus. The binder out of the house. <laughs> okay. You see all of that stuff that's there? Uh, we had mail. We had to forward mail to our son because his insurance stuff comes to our house. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on in your household. Yesterday in the mail, I got something about the kid that I support in, um, through World Vision. Again, that's something that comes through. Anything that comes through or goes on in your household is a part of that word oikos. Your house, your household. So it just doesn't mean the building, it means everything that goes on. Everything from the TV that you watch, to the food that you eat, to the leaks that you have to fix, everything is a part of the house, the household, okay? That's the first part of the word. The second part of the word is called nomos. It means law or rule. So we have law or rule over the household. So that is what that word means as a compound word. It means a steward was someone who was entrusted with the management of someone else's affairs or their household. The people in Jesus' day, uh, in that part of the world, and also in Rome, uh, if you had any kind of means at all, you did not take care of your household. You hired somebody to do it. You hired somebody and they oversaw it all. 
They oversaw your flocks. They oversaw if you had grapes for making wine, your olive trees. They oversaw it all. That was what they were hired to do. Well, Brenda and I were over at her folks' house about uh, two weeks ago, and they were talking about uh, a person who lived a few places over uh, that, the, that the husband had died. It sounded like he was an elderly man. And they have apple orchards. Uh, they have a person who manages, he is the steward of their apple orchards. They own the orchards. They have a person who does it. He's done it for a number of years. And he is the one who is responsible for making sure that there is a great apple harvest so that, the, so that the family can have the financial resources to be able to live. And so um, that man uh, leases some property from Bud and Barb, and he and his brother do root grafting uh, for orchard stock, new stock. And so he, he still does that as a side business, but his main business is to care for, to manage, or to be a steward of this other place that has a big orchard. Okay, so that would make, this would make a lot of sense someone who comes from that kind of culture, and that was what was going on in Jesus' world. Well, most of us don't hire stewards to manage our affairs. I know we don't. Do any of you here hire someone to make sure that everything goes on in your entire household goes well? No, most of it, that falls on us. Well, here's the deal. As a part of our responsibility that God has given us, not only over creation, but it relates to everything that we come in contact with, everything that he has brought into our lives, we are supposed to manage it and to care for it because it is his. And we're supposed to do it well. And we're supposed to do it the way that he wants us to do it. And so uh, the principle of, of, the, of responsibility is that you and I are stewards, managers of that which is God's that he has brought into your household and we've brought in, he's brought into our household, okay? Understand that? So we have the principle of ownership, we have the principle of responsibility. Now we're gonna have the one that we don't like, and that is the principle of accountability. None of us, and especially me, likes to be held accountable. That's why things like Weight Watchers does so much good, uh, it, because you're held accountable. You have to show up every week. Uh, up here on Monday mornings, we have a group that meets up here. They're not a part of our church, uh, but they're called TOPS, and this means take off pounds sensibly, and every week, one by one, they, watch in, they walk into a, a digital scale over in one of our storage rooms off of the fellowship hall, and one by one, they get on that scale, and they get weighed in, and there's a person there who makes sure that they're not cheating, and there's someone else who records it because there's accountability that is built into it. Well, as it relates to the accountability of stewardship, in Matthew 25, it's not on the screens because they would have taken way too many screens. Uh, verses 14 through 30, I'd like to read it to you. And this is Jesus talking here. And he's telling a parable, but it has to do with accountability in terms of stewardship. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave uh, five talents of money to another two and to another one talent, each according to his ability. And then he went on a journey, on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. 
See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seeds. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with bankers so that I, when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has been given more, he will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, there, uh, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now notice, there's one situation that Jesus didn't mention here, because they would have never done this. But it's so often what we do. I'm going to add that there was a fourth one. And he was given one talent. And that would probably be you or me. And what we did is we took it and we did what we wanted to with it. We spent it on this or we spent it on that and took not into account at all what the master wanted. And when the master came back and he said, where is my talent? Our response says, sorry, boss. I spent it. If the one who had been given one took it and dug it in a hole and put it in the ground and brought back the one to the master, and he was told by the master, which is Jesus here, I'm going to throw you out into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you think's in store for those of us who know the master and then do what we just described? There's accountability. Now, God doesn't want to scare us, and Jesus doesn't want to scare us. He wants us to be generous and all that sort of things. But there is a side that we have to be living up to and we need to just take very seriously. If God owns it, number one, there is responsibility, and we're responsible for it, and then there's accountability. Just remember that. There's, I don't want us to be afraid of God. I want us to be very serious, though, to realize that everything we own is his because we don't own it. This morning in our small groups, there was a question there, and this was about compassion. And the question was this, how much does personal debt hinder our ability to act compassionately and meet the needs of others? That's Lance's quick paraphrase because I didn't memorize the question. Wasn't that pretty close to the question? There's a lot of people that, are, that were in the small group that said that, yeah. And the answer is, it seriously impacts it. It seriously impacts it. There's an opportunity cost. If, if, if things go that way, it, there's no opportunity then to, for, for things to come over this way. And so it is a huge issue of using God's stuff in a way that will honor him. It's a mindset. It's a shift. Our culture doesn't understand it. We're not raised that way. But biblically, as we come into God's family, that's what he asks us to do, and that there is accountability. So there's the passage. God holds us accountable for how we manage what he has entrusted to our care. Now, I don't like to think of this next one because I don't like to think of because I'm doing something for God, I'm going to get a reward. Uh, that's, just, that's just me. But Scripture talks about a reward for those who use God things, the, God's things the way that God wants us to do. And it is also in that passage. What was the reward? The reward was, first off, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. And um, my hope and prayer for all of us is that when the time comes for us to stand before the Lord and we no longer take a breath here on this earth but we go to be before him, that he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Part of it will be because we've walked with him and we've gotten to know him and are, are close to him, but part of it will also be because we've managed his things well and we've used it in ways that he wants us to use it 
not only, it's not that he doesn't want us to have fun. Yes, he wants us to do that. Um, there's a lot of scriptures where we can look and see that, that all the money doesn't have to be given away and all that sort of stuff. But there's that part that for him to say well done when it comes to managing his stuff, I think is pretty big. The second thing that he says is I'm going to put you in charge of more things. I think this has to do a little bit with the here and now. Um, it's kind of crazy. And there used to be some statistics. I don't know what they are anymore, so I don't have the time to look it up. But it, they used to find that when people came to know Christ, that as they got their life kind of squared away, um, life kind of changed for them. It was amazing how many people um, were able to whether it would be get better jobs or manage their money better or to take care of things better or to take care of people better and all those sorts of things because of the change in our lives as we come to know Christ. And, and sometimes I think that God actually brings more things into our lives if we show that we're good at managing them. And I'm not saying we're going to get more money or things like that, but I can tell you this. I'm just going to use our benevolence fund as an, as an example. If you're visiting or if you're new here, the first Sunday of each month is communion. We take a special offering that's for our benevolence fund, and that goes to help people who are in need. It doesn't go to our budget. It doesn't go into anything other than that. Back in the day, um, uh, it was one of those things where someone would call us and they would say, I need help with my electricity or I need this, that, or the other thing. And you never knew whether they were telling you the truth or not. Uh, and what we found over time, that someone would hit this church one day, they'd hit the Covenant Church the next week, they'd hit Emmanuel Baptist the week after that, they'd hit Lutheran Church of St. Paul. Sometimes they hit us all on the same day with the same story. And if you met the whole thing, it didn't matter, they still went to all the others. Um, and, and so what we did is we only gave very little, relatively speaking, there are Typically, our maximum was $75, unless it was a need that was within the congregation. When we went to having Love, Inc., be, Love in the Name of Christ is a not-for-profit. Uh, they're, they're all across the country, but they're a separate chapter. There's one for Love, Inc., Pierce County. Um, when we went to having them be the people who did the, the clearance for us, the background checks, and did all that, we told Love, Inc., uh, we will meet everything that you can't get another church to meet. So instead of giving 50 to $75, there's times we give 200, 300, 400 dollars. That pile of money has never run out since we did that. Since we became better stewards. You know something else? The Covenant Church at the bottom of the hill, they work with Love Inc. If you go to the Covenant Church and say, I need help with, 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 with my electricity bill, they're gonna say, call Love Inc. If you give us a call, a stop by here, we'll say, you need to give Love, Inc. a call. I'll give you their phone number or their, their website. If you go down to, um, uh, to Manual Baptist and say, I need help, they're going to say, call Love, Inc. And what ends up happening is Love, Inc. actually talks to their creditor, and we find out what the scoop is. And then the, the resources are pooled. And I'll be honest with you, we give way more than any other church in the area. And Love, Inc. knows the deal. They get all the money they can get from everybody else. They call us, and we cover all the rest of it. We became good stewards. And that fund has never run dry. Ever. 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 To those who manage well, more will be given and put in charge of more things. And here's the other thing. Share in the master's happiness. Now, for those of you who are married, hopefully you have a happy marriage. Um, there's nothing quite like making your spouse happy. Or if you've got kids, nothing quite like making your kids happy. And for those of you who have kids, there's nothing quite like having your kids make you happy. When we do stuff, and are good managers of, of Christ's stuff. It makes him happy. It's as though he's smiling, seeing what you and I are doing. And if there's no other reason to be good stewards, we do it because we love him and he loves us. So, where is this coming down to? Because typically when we talk about stewardship, we're talking about raising money for the church budget, 
talking about raising money for the new sign that's going in out here, you know, talking about raising money for this. This is about a lifestyle, about how we manage and take care of God's things. So I want to tell you a story about what happened. This is short, what happened Monday. We have a, a, a worship service down at McGee's Guest Home for Men. Uh, it's here in Graham. Most of the guys who are there, uh, they're there because they can't afford to be anywhere else. Most of them have a mental or physical um, disabilities. Um, they are a wonderful group of men, and they are pretty much destitute. Um, a number of the guys um, have very severe mental issues. Some are physical, some are blind. The list goes on and on. Uh, so Sunday, I mean Monday, we had to be at a different time, than, a different day than normal because Carol, our, our liaison down there, um, her first grandson is being born and she's back someplace back east for the birth. Um, and so because of a different time, we had a smaller group. And there's one guy who's there every He's one of the guys who's there every week, every month. He was sitting in the back. And I'd never seen it before. He was kind of covering his ears. I thought, is our singing that bad? <laughs> they actually sing pretty good. They really do. Um, and then, right as I started to talk, he got up and he left. Actually, he left in the last song we were singing. He got up and left. But as he headed out the door, he turned and he looked, and he kind of smiled at me, and he walked out, which was kind of bizarre, but... That kind of stuff happens. People have to go to the bathroom. You know, who knows what it is. Um, when we, just before we finished, he walked back in and he sat in the front row. And as soon as we got done, he walked up to me and he held out his hand like this. And he said, Pastor Lance, they brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then he put this into my hand. That is probably every penny he had in his room. That is probably every penny that he has to manage. And there's probably about 60 cents in there. Uh, by the way, counters, when you go to this, this is going to go into our deacon fund or our Christmas fund, whichever you should decide. That's a guy who is taking care of God's stuff. And while we were there, God told him, go get it. And he came and he dropped it off. I have no idea when is the next time he's going to get any money at all? But I know he was following the Lord's leading on this Sunday when we're talking about stewardship. And I felt so convicted because here was one who was willing, most likely, to give it all because it's God's. That's being a good steward. Join with me as we pray. Father, all of us at times fall down on our task of stewardship. Sometimes it's because we don't want to admit that you're the owner Sometimes it's because we have fallen down on our call of responsibility. Sometimes it is because uh, we don't like the accountability that's there. But Lord, you meet us where we are. Develop in us, Lord, an attitude and a heart to be good stewards of what is yours. That we would be good managers so that when the time comes when we're before you, you would say, well done, good and faithful servant. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.